praise that you deserve. They're not good enough to praise you, Lord, but it's the best that we know how. So please receive our praise. We do love you, Lord. And Lord, you have spoken. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, you have spoken to us, Lord, and you've preserved it and you've sent through the generations this word. And so, Lord, we turn our attention now to your word, Lord, not just to be listened to, but Lord, might we ask tonight, God, what could we obey tonight afresh? What could we hear and do lest we deceive ourselves, Lord? So you have not spoken into the wind for nothing. You've spoken with purpose, and with purpose we now listen as your word is proclaimed. Please help us to have ears to hear what you say in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. It's great to hear you all singing out there. I love it. I can only imagine what God is thinking when he hears you sing. And uh, man, let's just drown that those speakers out with our praise. Would that be cool? And so uh, that's what we're shooting for. But um, I want to take a second before, I cer certainly want to jump into God's word. That's like the most important thing that we could possibly do with our time. But I want to take a moment and I want to, I want to pray with you um, a couple things. Uh, that we didn't let you know right away, but I want to just take a moment. Um, as many of you know, uh, Mr. Greg, um, Mr. Greg would sit right where Mike is sitting. Raise your hand there, Mike, right? You guys remember, uh, he used to tell me to call him a, a, a dark-skinned gentleman. That was what he said. Don't call me black. Don't call me white. Don't call me an African-American. Call me dark-skinned gentleman. So uh, he was like in his 60s, Mr. Greg, if you remember him. Uh, just a couple days ago, he has uh, finished his race here on earth, and uh, he uh, he was at the hospital over in the villages for a couple days. He had a really bad case of pneumonia, and he was in and out of consciousness, and he was on every single machine known to man, right? Uh, but when he came to for just a few moments, Pastor Jay and Marty were there to, to welcome him back to consciousness, and, he sa and they said, hey, how's it going? And, and this is, as it turns out, like I think two days before he passes, he just looks at Jay and said, I'm truly blessed and highly favored. Man, the guy, you can't learn to, 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 die, to, 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 to live until you learn how to die. And uh, so he's, he's gone, you know, and we'll miss him terribly. And, uh, but, you know, uh, don't forget him. He's a, he's a great example for us all, you know. We're supposed to come together and encourage one another. And Mr. Greg would always do that, no matter what was going on. Like, he, he, he listen, he's been coming to this church every week for like six years. And, and I love this guy. You know why? He never complained about a single thing, ever, right? Never complained. It didn't make a difference what was going on in his life. And you know when I met him? He was living in a homeless shelter, and he was truly blessed and highly favored every single time you asked him. Big smile on his face. You could never know if something bad was going on in his life because he was truly blessed and highly favored. He loves Jesus, and nothing in this life could disrupt that. And so he walked around with a big old happy smile on his face. So this is what we're going to do. we got a little plaque, just a little thing. We're going to put it on the seat over there. So you'll see it show up here in the next week or so. And you know what? We don't reserve seats around here, right? Nobody gets a seat. No one's special and privileged around here. But you know what? When you see the sign, maybe when you see his name and you walk into church with something heavy, you can look at his name and you'll see it right there. It's going to say, truly blessed and highly favored. And you can just maybe say those words and that could be the weapon of your warfare that gets you out of the funk that you walked in with, okay? So there's that, and pray for his family. I think, don't know yet till tomorrow afternoon as I meet with their family, um, but I think tentatively next Saturday, 1 o'clock, should be a funeral here. But uh, just watch our Facebook page. You guys all have our Facebook page? Who doesn't have our Facebook page, right? You have a Facebook page? Get on there, and, let's, and, and that'll be on there so you know for sure, okay? So um, I'll find out tomorrow. Um, and then we'll let you know as soon as we possibly can. Um, also, there's a, a new uh, couple that have been coming to the church just for like the last month, uh, John and Erin. Um, Erin, uh, she's got lupus, and so like, most of the time she's totally fine. Like, you're totally fine. Don't, don't know it. You couldn't tell. But every once in a while, bam, she gets this flare-up, right? And I don't even know what that looks like, sounds like, feels like, but she's getting it today. And so... Um, John has asked if we would just pray for her. So would you just do that with me for just a moment before we jump into God's word? Father, we want to uh, keep our word uh, to John. We want to partner with him. We want to agree with him. And no doubt, Aaron, uh, in asking you, Father, to comfort her, to please comfort Aaron, bring some healing and relief to her body right now. 
It is not your desire when you created to have disease and death and all these crazy things. Lord, it's part of the fall, and we understand that's what's happened because of it. But Lord, we also understand that no matter what the circumstance, you, a supernatural God, can invade that space and overrule whatever you desire. You are the name above all names. And so we're asking that you, Father, in the name of Jesus, would bring relief to a body that is diseased and bring healing to her, bring Bring faith, increase her faith right now. Let her know that you love her. And even right now, Lord, if you would bring a relief to her pain or discomfort, whatever this flare-up is, Lord, that you'd bring it right now. Not that she would see that there's power at revolution, but that there's power in the name of Jesus, and it's in his name that we're asking this, Lord. So thank you for that, and thank you for sending them here to our church, Lord. All right. For Ricky, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, we can pray for Ricky, um, Ricky uh, Golden Waller, and we, he was here on uh, Wednesday night, and uh, was it Wednesday night? No, when was it? What is it? Yeah, Wednesday, we, he was here Wednesday night, popped in, and uh, so we got to pray over him, and that was awesome, but Ricky has some, some busted up, jacked up uh, vertebrae in his back, and he really, really struggles, and he's like on, f the pain from that goes down into his shoulders and arms, into his hands, and it feels like he's a superhero. Did you ever see that movie, uh, Captain Marvel, that's out right now? And she has like her hands get on fire and shoot stuff? That's what Ricky feels like, but not in a good way, okay? So, um, so we just ask right now, Lord, uh, again, we know that he's been prayed for and prayed over and anointed uh, a, a million times. Uh, but your word says to keep seeking, keep knocking, keep asking, and that what we ask, we'll get. And so maybe this is the time, Lord. Maybe this is the time. Maybe it's just us here right now that finally does it, Lord, and you will answer the prayer of your people as we agree with all those who have prayed for his healing. We agree with them now in Jesus' name that you would bring healing to Ricky's body now. Be supernatural, Lord. Just show him and all the world how powerful you are, that we don't just pretend that you are strong. We don't just talk about a God of the ages that used to be strong, but a God that is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and still does miraculous things right here in this place. So we ask this in Jesus' name. Bring healing and relief to Ricky's body now. Amen. All right, so listen, we're going to continue our study. We're going to get into God's Word. Um, I want to start by just telling you it was about five years ago. Well, let me even go back. About, about nine years ago, I started this church and uh, really didn't have any idea what I'm doing. Not much better right now, but I think I'm getting a little bit better at it. Um, but we started this church because God said, go tell people about me and uh, use the book. So I just started to do that. And so lots of people started to come and gather and get baptized and everything. But there's really no structure. There was really no vision. There was nothing for anybody to buy into. We'd have you know, tons of people, but they're all still, you know, uh, drinking and smoking and cussing and having sex with everybody. It was just like a crazy scene. And uh, nothing was really, people weren't really growing, right? Um, the sign of, of disciple making isn't necessarily more butts in the seats, right? Okay. You want to see lives changed. And lives were not changing. There was just a lot of people coming to our church. And so, you know, super excited about our church. A lot of people were, but there was really no framework in which to work around to, to let people know, like, what is it that you're doing here? And so we started with this billboard, you know, Scumbags Welcome was out on the highway and people started to come and it was on the news and that's all great and fine. But we really weren't making any progress and so it was about, just to guess, about five years ago, I was talking to someone and, and they suggested that maybe I could um, just try to let people know like what it is you're trying to do, you know? And so I started to really think about it a lot. And all of a sudden there was one day, I was in my office and all of a sudden the sentence popped up into my head and I wrote it down on, you know those big uh, paper blotters like you put on an easel, you know what I'm talking about, like for a presentation? I actually have the same one. It's hanging on the inside of my office door, and I don't use it too often. But I wrote this sentence down onto that piece of paper, and I was just sat there, and I was staring at it for hours. And while I was staring at it and praying and thinking, it kind of, I realized that it captured beautifully the essence of, of the local church, you know, like what it is supposed to be, what it's supposed to do, you know, and, and so I, I want to share that, that sentence with you. I think we can bring it back, we can bring it up on the screen, okay, that's, that's what it is. It's a gospel-centered, culture-creating community bringing beauty to the world. Like that just, that just popped up into my head, right? 
And, 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 and at the time, like, I was like, is that you, Jesus? Is it, I mean, who, I don't know. Like, I've just, I, I just, it just popped up. And so I'm sitting there staring at it. And I'm like, man, that just kind of, it, it, it just, I think that it really captures the essence of the local church. So, so, so I just kind of want to walk you through that just a little bit. We've, we haven't done this in a long time. This is kind of our identification mark here at the church. So when people say, well, like, what is it about your church? You can tell them this, okay? And we should all understand what this is. So gospel-centered meaning that we realize as a people that it was the gospel that saved us, nothing else. It was the gospel that, that reconciled us with God. It was the gospel that reconciled us together, that the only reason why a church exists where people come together is because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, okay? So it's, it's the, it's the, we understand that the reason the church exists is because of the gospel, okay? Now, now that also means that everything we do, when we realize it's all because of the gospel, we realize that everything that we would do in this church as a group, now I'm not just talking about this church, I'm talking about any church, okay? would be gospel-centered also. We realize it's the gospel that brought us together. It's the gospel that established this thing. And so every single thing that we would do in a church would go back to, we'd lay that truth on top of this new endeavor, this new effort, this new idea. Is it to advance the gospel? Because everything we're to do here is to advance this gospel that created this place. And so every single time someone comes up with an idea, you lay that thing down over it and go, okay, is this thing going that we're about to spend money on, spend time on, spend people hours on, is this going to really advance the gospel? Or maybe it's just to make someone happy. Maybe it's what they always did in their old church, and so they wanna, you want to satisfy them because you don't want to lose a tither. These are truths, okay? But is it to advance the gospel because if it's not we don't need to do that thing if we're gospel centered okay now it says a culture creating community so we understand it is the gospel that brought us together that's the thing we have in common and so we're not supposed to let the things that are not of the kingdom influence what we do here do you understand that the culture that you live in is everything around you. It's everything you say. It's the stuff we say. It's the things we do. It's the way we dress. It's the way we talk. It's our transportation system. It's the government. It's, it's all of the stuff that we do that makes up America. And then the South has a different culture than the North. Right? And Christians are supposed to be a little bit different than other people. Everyone has their own way of doing things. And so when you realize it's all because of the gospel and for the gospel then this group of people, a community, it's not about yourself anymore. When you're in the church, you, you lay down your own personal things, and it's about this now. And so we're supposed to be learning to do something different. The culture out there and the culture in here is totally different. In here, they say that if you want to be the greatest, you have to be the least. The greatest in the kingdom will be the greatest servant of all. Jesus came to serve, not to be served. This is way different than anything else out there, right? In America, what are we here? We're here to serve ourselves. I love our country. Celebrated a great holiday the other day. Killer fireworks. I'm happy to be here. But the culture that we live in is not the same as the Bible. And so when we realize it's all about the gospel, that's supposed to shape the way we think and do and everyone should come here to learn a different way to live. It's according to the scriptures. And then we bring that to the world. You see it there. We realize it's the gospel that brought us together. It's the gospel that we advance. We learn how to do it together in community. No longer by ourselves doing our own thing. We lay down our own selfish desires and pick up the mission of Jesus Christ and so then we take that thing and we go out there as a city on the hill and we change our world that's what we're supposed to do and so having studied this and reading it and thinking about it over and over and over again I did what I think is the best thing I added the three most important words to it 
Revolution Church is a gospel-centered, culture-creating community bringing beauty to the world. Listen, that's who we are. That's who we are. That's who we're supposed to be. Revolution, by definition, is a sudden and momentous shift in the status quo. And listen, Karen did a great job. She asked if you're happy with the status quo. That's kind of a general question now. I'm talking about the status quo of every single thing in your life. It, it, can, can you look at your life and the life of the people around us and say, this is as good as it gets? Do you know that in America with the greatest natural resources, the greatest economy, greatest natural beauty, we have the highest use of depressant drugs? Why? Because the status quo is not good. The world we live in is broken and hurting. And so there should be a change in the way that we live. And so this is a revolution. And, that, and when we have that word revolution, we think of, of guns and swords and knives and pitchforks and fire. Right? That's not really what this is all about. Okay? The big shift in the status quo is that we as a group, as a family, that we would step in and adopt this new identity and, and of course, the mission and the purpose that goes along with it so that the status quo would not only change in our own life as we begin to live in a different way, a biblical way, but it would also change the community that we live in. Now, a lot of you may think, well, how could a little church like this actually do that? And sometimes I feel the same way, too. But I just want to bring you back real quick to the book of Acts when the church in Ephesus was started. So these guys go to the town and they share the gospel. And there was so much commotion and so many people got saved and their lives transformed that... The, the, the city was known for this, this, this false goddess, Artemis, and her temple was there, and people would come from all over to, to, to worship her there. Do you ever go to Disneyland, right? That's where Mickey Mouse is, right? So what do you do? You've got to buy a souvenir when you leave, right? You've got to have a souvenir. You've got to have a souvenir, right? Oh, Mommy, Daddy, give me a souvenir. You've got to buy him a stupid Mickey doll for 50 bucks, right? So that's what's happening over there in Ephesus, right? All these merchants were making these little Artemis statues and stuff, and that was the way they made money. And they started to complain, you can read in the book of Acts, that the whole socioeconomic climate of the city shifted because of what the disciples were doing there, because the gospel had invaded that city so much that they couldn't make money being evil anymore. So they want to have them arrested and put in prison. It changed the whole city. The gospel changed a city. And God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he can change our city. And I've always believed that God planted us here to do just that. We don't need another church. We need a more effective, powerful church where God shows up powerfully all the time and he wreaks havoc on the status quo and changes the climate of the city that we live in. I'm glad one person likes that. Thank you, Kathy. Now, there's a million ways that this can flesh out when the gospel invades a city. But the most powerful way that a community changes, the most powerful tool that the revolution has to change the status quo is found in 1 John. And so I would invite you to open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4. And we're going to study... Verse 7 through 21. We're going to continue our study of 1 John, this message series called Need to Know. These are massively important things that we need to know. He's writing this letter, not as an evangelistic letter to get people saved. He's writing it to save people. Because there's pitfalls that we stumble upon. And it can cause a massive rift in our relationship with the Lord. And John is a herald and he's saying... No, don't do this. Do this. And so I'm going to read 1 John chapter 4, 7 through 21. And I want to just see if you can pick up on the major theme of the text, the most powerful weapon of the revolution. See if you can pick up what it is, okay? So you guys all there? You have God's word in front of you? Awesome, awesome. I'm going to read it with you. 
<clears throat> chapter 4, starting in verse 7. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. That's a great place for an amen. I'm just saying, like, anytime you want to shout that out, that's totally cool, right? You won't get shunned. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, is the air conditioning even on? I am dying. What's the deal? Holy moly. You're cold? Going to Granny's house in here. What? All right, totally squirreled. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God. But if we, you know those movies that talk about how I went to heaven and I saw, yeah. yeah. Quit going to those things. Quit giving them an audience, okay? God's word said no one's ever seen God. Okay, yeah, just saying. But if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. And God has given us his spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us. Furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testified that the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. All who confess that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them, and they live in God. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in His love. God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid in the day of judgment, but we can face Him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. Such love has no fear, because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment, and this shows that we have not fully experienced His perfect love. We love, I don't like this translation right here. It says we love each other. Yeah. Well, yes. Um, but I think more accurately is we love Him because He loved us first. And then we understand here from what I'm about to read that we love each other, that kicks in too. So they're both valid. If someone says, I love God, but hates a Christian brother or sister. How many Christian brothers or sisters is he talking about there? Any, right? Any. So a single one. A single one, right? High water mark. But this is the word of God, right? This is not what you feel or what I think. This is the word of God, okay? If you say you love God, but you hate another bro Christian brother or sister, that person is a liar, I love God, but that, I'll tell you what, that Kathy over there, no, 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 you don't love God. No, you don't. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? And he has given us this command, not a suggestion, right? A command, those who love God must also love their Christian brothers and sisters. So I'm like, I'm not going to give you any hints, right? What's the, what do you think the, 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 the thing is? What's the main thing? Like, we're not going to give you any hints, not going to, what do you think it is? Anyone, any real smart people in here? What would it be? Oh my gosh, you guys are amazing. The church down the street never would have got that. <laughs> never. Love, 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 love. Listen, 20, in that, just in that what I just read to you, 27 times love is mentioned seven times in only 15 verses um, in this short letter of first John 48 times John mentions love listen it is the absolute highest of Christian ethic it is the pinnacle Paul said in first Corinthians 13 there's three things that'll last forever let's test your Bible knowledge here what are they anyone three things that last forever faith hope and love, right? That's the top three. And of the top three, the number one answer on the board, the greatest one of all of them that are going to last forever is what? Love. Is love. It's love. <clears throat> There's lots of beliefs that are important, lots of practices and giftings 
that are crucial elements to our Christian walk. But of all these things that we're talking about that are important, these different things that we believe and the different things that we practice and the, all these different giftings that we have of the Lord, they're all super important, but here's how God prioritizes these things as opposed uh, as compared to love. Also in 1 Corinthians, right at the beginning of the chapter, Paul says, if I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels. What are we talking about there, right? It's the, this is your Pentecostal time right now. You get a chance to go, here we go. It's awesome. It's going to happen. What is it? It's tongues. It's both kinds of tongues, right? There's the tongues of the languages. Like I could speak German right now. I could speak Spanish right now. That, that would be totally cool. But then there's also this thing, right? Some of you have it and some of us don't where you just like all of a sudden you start speaking this kind of weird stuff and it, but it makes sense to God, right? And it just starts coming out of your mouth, right? And Paul's like, if I could do all that, right? Woo, look at the gifting. But didn't love others? I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Am I annoying yet? You want more? Okay. All the Holy Spirit gifting in the world, if you don't love other people, just keep your gifting to yourself. Nobody wants to hear it because that's what you sound like. If I had the gift of prophecy, watch this one. And if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge. If you're the smartest dude ever, you knew everything about God, like even the mysterious stuff that's not even in here. What? And if I had faith to move mountains, you know, somewhere in the Bible it talks about if you have faith like a mustard seed, you could talk to a mountain and it could move. But yeah, nobody's ever moved a mountain. But Paul's like, well, what if, I was, what if I was that guy? What if I had enough faith, not only did I know everything, but I had enough faith that I could move mountains? The first person to ever do that, right? But didn't love others? I'd be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor, right? Man, man, I can't wait for the offering basket to come by. I'm, I'm going 11% this week. 11. I'm going deep, man. Y'all, look at this. But if I gave everything I have to the poor, here comes the plate. I'm giving out, I'm, I'm signing a check for my whole bank account. I'm going all in. Because everyone in this world that doesn't know Christ is poor. I need to get to them. I'm giving it all. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, what if I... What if I martyred? What if I, what if I died for my faith and I would never deny Jesus and I gave my body? I could boast about it. Look at me, look at me, look at me. People do that. Although I don't know how much boasting you do if you're dead. Side note. <laughs> but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is the highest Christian ethic. Jesus himself, our great teacher, the one who teaches us the most, the one we're supposed to actually be like, he says in Matthew 22 that of all the commands, every command that Almighty God has laid before man, all of them, tons of them, right? You read your Bible like, shall this, shall not that, do this, don't do that, must do this, must not do that. All the, the commands that God has placed before man, that the greatest of all these commands is to love the Lord God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor, your own people, other Christians, as yourself. He also teaches us, <laughs> this is crazy, you know you're a disciple of something, right? You're copying something. You're emulating someone. You're showing something. He said, you'd be my witnesses, right? So he says, the greatest display of my reality and that you're actually saved, that you're one of mine, John 13, 35. 
your love for one another will prove to the world that you're my disciples, right? That when they see you, they'll see me. They won't see your favorite team. They won't see your political party. They won't see, what they'll see is me. And the, and the way that that's gonna, the way they're gonna see me is the way we love one another. Not in, not in the way I feed the poor, not in the way I serve in the church, not how good I would preach or how great I would sing or how much I give. Those are all good things. But the way that people are going to actually see me, Jesus said, is by the way you and I love one another. It's massively important. Peter also tells us in 1 Peter 4.8, he says that as the end of the world, as we know, it comes to its end, we need to be earnest and disciplined in our prayers. Would you agree? It's starting to unwind, right? Things are going really bad. Morality's in the toilet. I mean, it's just terrible. I understand. I'm living it too. I try not even to watch the news because it breaks your heart. But as things start to, 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 to fall apart and we go down and down and down, it's true. we gotta, we got to pray more. we got to be earnest and disciplined in our prayers, right? Because the world's trying to bring us down and things are going bad and we want to pray for people so that they'll get saved and get better and we want to pray for ourselves so we can stay out of that sewer, right? We need to pray more. Who, who's all on board with that? You, you agree we need to pray more, right? But, but, but listen, he says, but more than that, but most important, more than that, as things worsen, we need to continue to show deep love for each other. For love covers a multitude of sin. In other words, I believe what this is teaching us is as things go downhill, and they are, I get it. It's not going to get better. We might be able to change the climate of a city, but the world as a whole, it's not going to get better, guys. It's going to get worse. And as it begins to get worse, there's more pressure on the church, isn't there? There's more pressure on the church, more persecution on the church, more hate for the church. The truth that's withstood thousands of years of time is now shunned. And everyone says, we're, we're preaching hatred. And so when the pressure comes, right, even the most faithful, sometimes they start to feel the pressure and they might try to to get out, and they might fall victim to the pressures of the world and start to act in ways that you don't like because the pressure's on, right? None of us has a gun to our head now, but when the gun comes, some of us are going to try to bail. And when you love your brothers and sisters and you see them doing stuff that you don't like, it's hard, and so that's why it says we need to continue to show deep love for each other because love covers a multitude of the sin. When things are starting to get ugly within the church, right? We need to love one another through the ugliness and through the failures because it's coming. And so we can see time and time again in the scriptures that love is the absolute pinnacle of Christianity. And as we learned two weeks ago and are now here again reminded again in these verses, one, what love is commanded, right? That's from two weeks ago. Love is commanded and love also is the defining mark of salvation. It defines whether you're his or not. And so listen up. Since we know that it's commanded, that's kind of funny, it's kind of weird, right? Love is commanded. So if love is commanded, loved ones, then we know that love isn't a result of getting saved it's the choice of the saved person. Do you understand, right? It, a lot of people think that when you get saved, you get so radically changed that you're just going to love. If that's the case, why is God commanding you to do it? If we're to be saved and automatically start loving everybody like crazy, it wouldn't be a command. And so because it's a command, then we understand it's the choice of a saved person. And since love is a choice... The Apostle John is hammering down on our choice to love as a true follower of Christ. Now remember, again, this letter is not written to non-believers telling them that, listen, if you love all these other people, that you're going to get saved. 
Okay, that's not what it's saying. And I've had some, I've got to clarify some. I've had some pushback from people in this church that have actually now left the church because they think I'm teaching a salvation of works. And I'm like, where did you hear that? So let me clarify this again, because this will be now the third time I've said this during the series. And this is why you don't just listen to sound bits on YouTube, okay? You get involved and you listen th to things at their full length. And you hear me say that it doesn't make any difference if you did absolutely every single thing perfect, not only in 1 John, but in every single page of Scripture, if you did everything right, but you don't say yes to Jesus as Lord and Savior, you're not going to heaven. Do you understand? Do you understand? Total clarity there, okay? You're, you're not, he said that there's, that, there's a, that there's a narrow gate, and in Romans 10 something or other, he says, I'm the gate, okay? I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to the Father except through me, okay? Doing all these things right in 1 John was not the intention of the letter so that you can get saved, okay? Not at all. Those things don't save you. Jesus Christ saves you, okay? All right. So, now listen. There's a guy in Scripture, just to clarify this, there's a guy in Scripture who absolutely gets this. Absolutely gets this truth, and I want you to put your eyes upon it so that we can clarify this once and for all, okay? Philippians chapter 3. Do me a favor and turn there. Philippians chapter 3. Don't just listen, okay? You should, you should read it yourself. It's super important. The, your eternity is in the balance of what you believe about God, okay? So don't just listen to some dude up here rambling on, okay? You need to listen and learn yourself. Philippians 3, 5 through 9, Okay? So here's the Apostle Paul, and, I'm, and, and remember I said, if you do everything right according to this book, you do it all right, it doesn't get you saved. So this is what he said, I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel. Like, so you guys know, I probably know that I'm Jewish, right? Yeah, I'm not a pure-blooded citizen of Israel, but I'm Jewish. Okay? This guy is the real deal. Okay? He was circumcised on the eighth day pure-blooded citizen of Israel, and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. Like, I don't even, I, I could do Ancestry.com, and I could get maybe a good guess. He knew. I am, a, I am original Jew. A real Hebrew, if there ever was one. And these, and remember, these are the chosen people, right? The chosen people. And Paul's like, of the chosen, I am him. I was a member of the Pharisees. You know, the Pharisees are the ones, it says, they demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. So these Pharisees were the guys kind of like me who would be up teaching the Bible. These were the guys that, like, they knew what they were talking about, okay? So he was one of those guys. He wasn't just a passive recipient of an occasional Bible study or maybe some traditional hand-me-downs that he heard orally. Like, no, he studied the Bible like crazy and strict obedience to it. So he did it all. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church and as for righteousness, like doing the right thing, he says, I obeyed the law without fault. So he was, according to the Bible, he was perfect in his obedience to all this stuff. Okay? I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, dung, duty. You understand? That's what some, some translations say it. Dung, duty. It's crap. All this stuff, this perfection of obedience to the word is crap compared to, okay? I no longer count, oh no, let me, I don't want to miss any of it. I discarded everything else, counted it all as garbage, crap, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. See, you, you, gotta, you don't want to miss this nuance here. Look what he said. To gain Christ, it's not that you don't have to obey the law anymore. It's you need to let go of this idea that if you obey it, that somehow you've passed the test. Okay? The only way you can gain Christ is to lay that idea down. 
and realize that even if I do it all perfectly, that doesn't get me in. Does he want us to keep his rules? Church? Yes. But does that get you saved? No. No. What does? The infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus as Lord, right? That's it. That's what gets you saved. I no longer count on my own righteousness through, through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ, okay? So, so now, if Jesus has saved you, then what, what John is saying is now, choose, because you are saved, to love all other Christians, Can somebody say, that's tough, right? That's tough. Super hard, right? It's super, super hard. So listen, if you've got saved back whenever, who knows when it was, year ago, month ago, five years, ten years, decades walking with, like you got saved, like that's awesome, right? I'm not saying you didn't get saved. I'm not saying you didn't walk some aisle somewhere and, and truly give your life to Christ and make him the Lord of your life and, 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 and confess your sin to him and embrace him by faith as Lord and Savior. I'm not saying that you didn't, but maybe decades have gone by and you're just kind of going through life and you start thinking, okay, well, how, you know, like, how, 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 am, I, how am I doing now? Like, I, I remember that day back in 1975, but what about, like, what, what, what about now? Well, 1 John 2, 4 says you must, say must, You must remain faithful to what you were taught in the beginning. Is that a suggestion? And because you guys are awesome note takers, you know that two weeks ago, what was the thing that we were um, taught from the beginning? Anyone know? Cheat sheet. You ready? Cliff notes. Love one another. That's what we learned. To love one another. Listen, so let's repeat it again. You must remain faithful in loving one another. Does that make sense? I'm not changing the word of God there, am I? We must, right? You must remain faithful to what you were taught in the beginning. You must remain faithful to loving one another. Love is commanded. Love is proof. That's all review. And now this, this is new. Love is persevering. That's our first point for the night. Love is persevering, right? You see it right there in the text. Look back at 1 John chapter 4, right there in verse 7. Dear friends, let us, what? Continue to love one another. Let us continue to love one another. Y'all admitted it's kind of tough to do that, right? I, I talked about this last week. I was admitting that, that I struggle with what the Bible says, that uh, you know, care for the flock God has entrusted to you. Do it willingly and not grudgingly. And I kind of fail in that for you know often. And it's been often and many times over the years. And I sometimes want to quit. And because I get aggravated by people like yourselves and I love you all but you know it's not easy to do that because you know sheep bite and I'm not saying that you're lesser or I'm greater in any way but just biblically it's sheep and shepherd kind of a model right and so if I've been in, I've been trusted to care for a, a, a flock of sheep sometimes sheep bite right they don't sometimes they don't mean it sometimes they do like I understand that wolves come into the flock, right? The ones that are like literally assigned by Satan and they are told to come here and disrupt what's going on there. I don't want Jesus winning. I don't need any people getting baptized over there. So let's wreck that scene. Like I get all that and we expect that, right? You expect the wolves. But what you don't expect, what makes it hard to do it willingly and without grudge is is the ones who come to you and they look you in the eye and they oh I just love you so very much and I see God all over you and it's just so awesome and like two weeks later they're talking bad about you and they don't like the way you do things and they don't like your philosophy and your style and your life and your hairdo and your clothes that you're wearing and they start and they start telling everybody about it and then they leave and they take people with them say that's not cool that's that's not cool and so we, because, listen, we have, we have expectations of a Christian, right? We have expectations for ourselves. We have expectations for other Christians. And, and some of them are good expectations, like biblical expectations. And they're right and they're true. And we should live up to them, right? Sometimes we have expectations that are conjured up in our own little silly brain of what we think a Christian should do. But the truth is, is that no matter what happens, if someone that is near and dear to you 
does something to like, you know, harm you or hurt you or, or slander you or betray you, whatever it is, or to someone that you love, right? Your love for that brother, let's just be confession in church, right? It starts to diminish rapidly, right? Am I alone? Don't leave me hanging, right? Okay, we're all guilty of it, right? And, and, and I know that. So like what, what, because we're told to love each other, but you're ticking me off and I'm not loving my, right, it's going down, right, it's going down. What do I do? What do we do? What am I supposed to do with all that, right? I mean, <laughs> the law says love them. Get that. My brain is going, love them. I, 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 I get the law and I'm, I understand what it says, but like, I'm not able to do that, God. Like, I really, I want to, I want to, I want to love him, like, real bad, right? And so where do we, how do we, what, what well, my well's dry. What, what well am I supposed to run my bucket down to kind of grab hold of that authentic, true love so I can go ahead and really love that person? How do I do that? God, the answer is right in his word. It's in the very next part of the verse. Look what it says. We have to continue to love one another, but it's hard, for love comes from God. That's the well. That's the well that never runs dry. You go back to God and you ask Him, right? So continuing to love somebody, it's not a bootstrap thing, right? It's not a suck it up buttercup thing at all, okay? You and I do not have the capacity to, to conjure up an authentic, true love, and that means felt and shown right that's what real love is felt and shown no matter what is going on i cannot do that and you cannot do that ever right when we're ticked off and hurt and sad and cheated and betrayed we could fake it till we make it that's a that's a common one right we could fake it till we make it and put on some fake phony smile right and all the while, we're just masking the fact that I'd like to give him a forearm right to his face. And let's be honest, right? Or we could, we could force ourselves to be nice, but all the while, while we're giving you a ride or helping you out, <laughs> that's my default. That's what I do. Don't leave me hanging here, right? Anybody else? Please, confession in church. We need to set up a booth. Come on, Father Moses is here. Right? I'm just kidding. Totally kidding. Totally kidding. Totally kidding. Or, instead of faking it till we make it or forcing it, we can fall on our knees and we can ask God to once again fill us up with love. The love that loved the men that nailed him to that Roman tree. The love that loved the wretched, lawless, immoral, drunk, cussing, smoking, I have kids in the room that I can't say what their dad, Moses, used to do. That kind of love. That overwhelming love that brought you to your knees that first day when you said, I can't believe that you love me. Right? Falling back in love for the first time again. That's the kind of relapse we should be desiring time and time and time again. That's what we're supposed to do. We're... we're we're supposed to be like Paul. I love this. I love because the Bible is so gritty and dirty and awful, and it's so true. Like this stuff, I wouldn't put in there. And Paul, the guy who wrote half this stuff, he in Romans seven, he's like, "I love your law, right?" And, and the, what's the law here? We're supposed to love each other, right? He's like, "I love your law. I'm just having trouble doing it, man." You know, like, I, 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 lo I, lo I love you. I've given my life to your law, to, to knowing it, to memorizing it, to sharing it. I love your law, but I can't seem to pull it off. I'm, listen, I'm weak. I'm weak. He goes on there. He says, who can help me? Can I run to my mom's house? Can I, can I go to the preacher? Can I, who can help me in this life filled with sin and death? But Jesus, that's the well that never runs dry. That's where you run your bucket down to get that authentic, real love that you could not conjure up on your own. 
A persevering love is supernatural. It's not something that you can conjure up time and time and time again. Look at verse 8. Look at the end of it. God is love. You can't conjure it up because it's nothing. You don't have it. It's God. He's love, right? And again, down in uh, verse 16, he says it again. God is love. He says it twice. God is love. So listen, recognizing your inability to love authentically and, and needing God's help is actually good. And that's, listen, this is, we're talking about a culture creating community, bringing beauty to the world. This is countercultural. To admit your weakness is good? It's not good here. It, weakness is a flaw in our world. Right? Especially for, I'm, I'm, I don't know what it's like to be a lady. But for a man, I like to fix some stuff, man. Bring me your problem. I'll fix it. I'm smart, man. I'm crafty. I can, I can fix stuff. Not just fix situations, but bring me your car. Bring me your, bring your appliance. I'll go to you. I'll fix your thing. I'll fix your irrigation. I'll fix your stuff, right? And to admit weakness is shunned in our world. God told Paul personally in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my power works best in weakness. I can't show up the way I could if you're so dead set on trying to conjure it up yourself. You want to try to love? Go for it. But my help's going to be limited there because you won't let me in. My power works best in weakness. And so instead of Paul rebelling like we would do, like not admitting weakness, you don't want to cry, you don't want to show that you can't do it and be the guy that everybody turns to. He's like, so in response to what God says, he goes, so you know what? So now I'm glad to boast in my weakness. I'm like, I love my weakness. I'm, I suck. I can't do anything. Woo! Like, what? I, I boast in my weakness and I take pleasure in it. Mind blow, right? Like, why would he say this? Like, I can't. Hey, guys. Hey, Aaron. Nice to meet you. I, um, I just can't do anything. I just want to let you know that. I'm so excited. Like, don't come to me for help for anything. I'm incapable of helping you in every way. Hey, how's it going, Bethany? I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm the worst pastor of all time. You really shouldn't even come here. I cannot help you. Yes! Woo! Who does that? Paul. But he knows why, because there's a secret there. The secret to success is he says, if I'll boast of my weakness, I'll be all excited about it. Like, it's a good thing I take pleasure in it. Why? Because in it, Christ's power can work through me. That's why. It's good to be weak. Like, we don't need to be, you know, big, proud, awesome, powerful Christians. You know how you're the most powerful Christian? Here's the most powerful Christian. God, I can't do a stinking thing help like that's that's the most powerful christian there is i can't do anything without you nothing i'm not capable of doing anything persevering love and it's supernatural love okay god's the well god's the well you run down okay here's the second thing first thing is love perseveres second thing is uh, love grows love grows um Two verses I want to bring your attention to. It's, we read it. But look here in verse uh, 17 first. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfectly. You know why I'm reading this? Because, you know, if you go to church, you shouldn't just listen to what the preacher has to say. Like, you should, you should be able to find that in the Bible, right? You should be able to find it in the Bible. So that's why we have our Bibles open here. It says, verse 17, right? He says, um, and as we live in God... Our love grows more perfect. And then look at verse uh, 12. Uh, no one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, that's a qualifier, isn't it? But if, but if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us, right? It's coming to full expression, like the utmost. It's getting bigger. It's getting more. It says, as we live. You see the text there? It's like this, it, it, it hints to this ongoing, persevering, 
connectedness with God. As we see, it's one thing to know about God, right? It's another thing to really know Him, right? To, I mean, it's what you like. If you, it's like a wife or a husband, right? You, you don't know about Him, right? You know Him. You spend time with them, right? And it's the same thing here. As you, as we, as you live in God. The love grows. And so this is where Jesus would kind of remind us, like in uh, things like John chapter 15, where he says, listen, abide or remain in me, and I will remain in you. There's another qualifier. Nobody likes to hear that in church, but it's just what it says. If you abide in me, then I'll abide or remain in you. For apart from me, you can do nothing, right? So as you live in God, as you abide in Christ, as you, Colossians 2, 6, just as you called him Lord, you must continue to follow him. So as you're doing this, your love grows more perfect. You see it right there in the text. As you're pursuing him, as you're attached to him, as you're abiding in him, Right? So you'll see a greater capacity to love God start to, sp- to sprout up inside of you and a greater capacity to love others. So as we continue to seek the Lord, as we continue to meditate on His Word, as we continue to pursue Him in prayer, as we live in God, as the prophet Hosea would say, Oh, that we might know the Lord. Let us press on to know Him. And as we're doing this, God is perfecting. He's making your love bigger and better and deeper for him and your greater capacity to love one another as you live in him. And so as the years of earnest pursuit, not lethargic, not complacent, not showing up once in a while and there's nothing else better to do, but as you live in him, constantly pursuing him, the rewarder of those who earnestly seek him, he says that as you have these years of earnest pursuit march on, you should be more and more loving than the man or woman in the rearview mirror. More than you used to be. A greater desire to love that fleshes out in a greater desire to help others and serve others within the family of God. And when love in us grows, it absolutely begins to show. It is visible. And here's the mind-blowing truth about how we love one another, how we help and serve one another because of our love for each other. Right? I just want to remind you again what it says there in verse 12 that no one has ever seen God. Like, we want people to love the Lord, right? We want them to. Everyone in here, if you're a Christian, awesome. You want people to love the Lord, right? You want to see this place packed out with people that get saved? Do you want that? I want to see that, right? So, so, so you want them to love the Lord. But it, it, look at what it says, though. No one has ever actually seen this God. Like, it's one thing if God showed up here and said, here, here's what I offer you if you'll bow before me. Like, that would probably be an easy sell. A lot easier than a God you can't see. Like we're trying to tell people about a God you can't even see. That's a tough deal. No one has ever seen God. But if we love each other, so just imagine that, that way that we love one another, help each other, serve one another within the body of Christ together. Not just the way we love the world, but the, we love each other. Then that means God's in us. And his love is brought to full expression in us. His love is brought to full expression in the way we love one another. That is the most visible display of the love of God in the universe. It's not your baby. It's not the oceans and the mountains. Listen, this is going to be hard for you. It's not even the cross, because we want to believe that that's what it is. God showed his great love by sending his son to die while we're sinners. I get it. But the word of God is the truth. And the fullest expression of God's love in the universe, you read it, in the way we love one another. Now, if that doesn't put a priority stamp down on pursuing God and living in God so that we could love each other more, I don't know what will. Knowing this truth 
that this, this is the ultimate display of God in the universe is the way the church loves one another. And, and listen, we should all be repenting for the church. How we don't love one another. Hey, I don't like the shoes that you're wearing. I'm going to start my own church. I don't like the way you preach. I'm going to start my own church. Oh, I love God, but I don't love you. No, you don't love God then. Right? We need to, the display of love for one another displays the love of God to the universe. How are we doing with that? How, how, what would you say is, a, is the GPA for the church in America on that one? D? D minus? I'd say drop out. We need to do better. That's a sudden and momentous shift in the status quo, isn't it? To, to really, not, not just merely say we love one another, but to love one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Right? So somebody does something you don't like in the church or has a different doctrine than you, a little bit different belief. They all say Jesus is Lord, but they express it in a different way. If we put doctrine above love, epic failure, right? What's the highest ethic? Doctrine? Love, right? And you can't say, I love God, but I don't love that guy, right? Because then he says, you're a liar, right? We're not doing so good with that, okay? Not doing so good with that at all. And so, listen, you want to see people get saved? You really want to see people get saved? Then they need to see us get along. They need to see us love one another in a way that, it, that transcends all non-church relationships. Something special needs to be going on there. I said a couple weeks ago, I'll say it again, loud and proud, we should be the greatest clique in the world. Everyone's like, oh, that church is so clicky. Good. You should, it, 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 they should walk in here and see such a tight-knit group of people. They're like, I want to be a part of that thing. I can't believe they love each other like that. I saw that guy serving her and her serving him and they were helping each other. I saw it on Facebook. They're loving and babysitting and helping and shoveling his driveway and cutting his grass and what the heck's going on with these people? I want in. That's what should be happening. I sounded like Kramer right there. For, forgive me. <laughs> totally lost control. Never thought that that was going to happen, but here it is. So as we pursue the Lord, he perfects our love for one another. And this segues perfectly into the third and the last thing here. It's kind of a weird statement, but here's the, here it is. Vertical love is horizontal love. You guys know what I'm talking about then? So let's talk about the vertical thing, right? Where's God? All over, right? Fills the universe with himself. If you're a, sa if you're a saved man or woman, you're anointed. You, his Holy Spirit is right here, right? You get that. But God's kind of weird in this way. Like he's, he's, he's here. Uh, he's in heaven, which we, I always point there, but I don't really know where it is, right? Let's be honest, right? It's somewhere. somewhere. Uh, he's in you. Uh, and then it also says that he fills the universe with himself. So he's like right there and right there and right there. Like oh, he's everywhere, right? But when, when we talk about him, he's high and lifted up, right? He's exalted above all things, transcendent. So what do we do? It's, and he's really not there, but he's everywhere. You know, you know what I'm saying, right? So vertical love is like the love that we have for one another, like for, for me and him. Like I love Jesus, he loves me. It's a vertical pipeline kind of a thing. Do you guys you understand what I'm talking about? Vertical, vertical. And then horizontal is what? Like the love that we have for each other right here, right? That's horizontal, right? So, if we, so here's the claim that vertical love is horizontal love. So we go back to God's great commandment, right? So there's this, this Jewish guy, this Pharisee, he, he goes up to Jesus, and he's like, hey, uh, Jesus, um, what's the greatest commandment? Show of hands, how many people think that Jesus misunderstood what he was asking? Right. Don't, don't raise your hand, Serenity. Love you, right? Now, he didn't misunderstand in any way, right? He's the sovereign king of the universe. I think he gets it. Okay? But he gives an answer. So the guy says, hey, what's the greatest, what's the greatest commandment? What's that? Singular, right? Singular, singular, singular. But Jesus, Jesus does this weird thing. He, he answers the singular question with a plural answer. It's kind of weird, right? But it's not unique to the Bible. It's not unique to, to God in any way. Um, John told us back in chapter 2 that if you deny the Son, you deny the Father. Right? So they're kind of like, how many gods are there? But there's the Father, there's the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's kind of weird, right? No one can really understand all that. But there's one, but you get two. So like, you get three. Like, I don't even understand all that, right? Um, it's kind of like, hey, um, I, love the, I love Jesus, but I don't love the church. I don't like church people. 
It, that doesn't fly, right? You can't love Carl and not love, and not love Kim. You can't love Kim and not love Carl, right? The two become one. That's marriage. That's, the, that's an example of what happens with Christ and his church. When you say yes, you're married to him. You can't love the groom and hate his bride. And the Bible says that we're his body. Like we're actually, this is kind of weird too, and don't ask me to explain it, that you're in Christ. Does anyone fully understand all that? I don't. You're in Christ, and Christ is in you at the same time. Like, how does that even happen? I don't even know, but it's true, right? And, and we're his bride, so we're married. The two become one. Like, so you can't say, I love God and not love Nikki, right? It just doesn't work that way, right? And so it's the same here with this question here. Like, what's the great commandment? And he's like, um, love God and love his people. It's one commandment. They go, in other words, they're so, they go so hand in hand. They're so, they're so completely interwoven with one another that you can't have one without the other. There's no such thing as loving God and not loving his people. There, there, that, that is not an answer that is available to the Christ follower. You, you're not allowed to give that answer because it doesn't exist. Well, yeah, I mean, I love, yeah, yeah but, but I, I, I love God, but, but, you know, that Nick, man, he, no, listen, God doesn't care about your yeah, buts. The word is clear, okay? L look at verse 20 and 21. Look at it says, if someone says, I love God, but hate, I'm going to use you, Nick, because you're sitting right here. If someone says, I love God, but I hate Nick, then that person is a liar. No, that means that you don't love God. It means that you don't love God. And, and this letter is written to Christ's followers. So as you go along in life as a Christ follower and you run into Nick and he ticks you off, and now, I hate that guy. We're running into a problem here. You see, it's not an evangelistic letter, and I've been beating this thing to death, but you've got to understand something here. There's a there's massive warning in this book. And I don't care where you stand theologically. That's your, that's your prerogative to make these decisions. But remember, this letter is not written to non-Christians. It's written to Christians. And the moment they come up to the altar or wherever they happen to say yes to Jesus and bend the knee and embrace him by faith as Lord and Savior and receive the anointing of his spirit inside of them, now this is about something afterwards but then you hate another brother or Christ, another Christian. You can't hate another Christian until you are a Christian, right? Because otherwise they're not a brother. They're not a sister. So we're running into a real, real problem right here, okay? All this persevering love, all this perfecting love, all this vertical and horizontal love stuff is super, super important, and it needs to have a priority stamp because not only does the eternity of the onlooker, right, when people see the ex expression of love between us, like their eternity is on the line here. That's what they're going to see that's going to invite them in to the body of Christ. So not only is their uh, eternity involved, but yours as well, Christ follower. Look at it says here. Look at verse 16 and 17. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. That's awesome. So now we're saved, right? We put our trust in his love. God is love. We put our trust in him. And all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. That's awesome, right? That's awesome. And as we live in God, his, our love grows more perfect, so we will not be afraid on the day of judgment. But we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. What does this have to do with the day you got saved? I don't see it there. Such love has no fear because perfect love, and that's the big thing, perfect love expels all fear. See, if we're afraid, it's for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. So, remember, this letter is not written to unbelievers. This letter is written to, as chapter 2 would say, written to God's children because your sins have been forgiven through Jesus. 
So why would someone like that be afraid of judgment and punishment? They're saved. Saved people embrace Christ. Can't wait to... Why, why are they a saved? Well, because, again, just like Paul would say, just as you accepted Christ as Lord, so you must continue. So we're not saying you never gave your life to Christ. We're not saying you never said yes to Him. But the problem is that only perfect love expels all fear. And I'm a Bible guy, and I take every word of this very seriously. Perfect love didn't show up on the cross. Awesome love did. But we learned in the Word that perfect love grows in you and comes to its fullest expression as you live in God. It's a sanctifying thing. This is what happens. And in that type of love, that love expels all fear. Not that one-time thing that, I'm, and I'm, again, listen, I'm not saying you didn't say yes. The Bible is not questioning your salvation experience. Many times in the scripture, it's, it'll reaffirm it, like, like I said about Paul. Just as you came to Christ as Lord, so now you must continue to come to Christ as Lord. Right? Just keep doing it. It's not a one-time thing. Only perfect love expels the need to fear judgment. And perfect love is not given at the cross. Perfect love is given and fully expressed as we live in God. Perfect love expels all fear of punishment or judgment. So, loved ones, as we finish up here, we're going to move on in our gathering here. But I just want to say that love is the most powerful weapon of the revolution that we have at our disposal to push back darkness and cause massive change in the community that God has planted us in. And so in prayer, I want to pray with you guys right now. So could we move on? I want to pray with you right now, and I want to do this in our prayer time. I want to recommit ourselves. I want to recommit ourselves to as we live in God. As we live in God. See, if 1 John is anything, it's a lot of things, but if it's anything, it's a warning against a complacent faith. It's a warning against a lethargic pursuit of God. And it's an invitation into a white, hot, earnest pursuit of God. Okay? And that's all over the Bible. This is not exclusive to John. And so listen, if we're going to really secure this relationship that we have with Jesus, right? it's a as we live in God, God perfects our love. If we abide in Him, He will abide in us, and we will bear much fruit. For those that are in me that do not produce fruit, my Father cuts them off and throws them into the fire to be burned. This is the word of the Lord. It's not the word of me. It's the word of the Lord. And so let us recommit ourselves right now to as we live in God. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for that, for that bold warning we thank you for the boldness of, of the Apostle John who penned these warnings to us. We thank you, Lord, that you love us enough to tell us how we should live our life that is most pleasing to you and most beneficial to us and the ones that are around us. Lord, I have to admit that, that our church and all churches, like we're not really batting a thousand here when it comes to loving one another and displaying that great love. There's a world out there, Father, that is dying and hurting and without hope, and they're looking to find hope. They're looking to find faith, and they don't know how to find it because we do not love each other the way that we're supposed to. No one has ever seen you, Father. But if we love one another, then you live in us, and we live in you. And your love comes to full expression in us. God, that just blows my mind. We need help. We need help. Help us to love one another. You said, Lord, that as we live in you, so as we pursue you, as we pursue you in prayer, and as we pursue you in the word of God, and as we pursue meditating on the word and studying the word, 
as we press on to know you more, earnestly seeking you with our whole heart, you'll increase our capacity to love one another, which is what the world needs to see. So please help us with that. I don't know if this is biblical or not, Lord, but I'm just I'm begging you to make that change in us. Make your promptings loud where we could hear them and heed them. When we're, when we're encouraged to love someone within the body of Christ that seems unlovable, that ticks us off, that disappoints us, that doesn't live up to our expectations or yours, would you help us to give an allowance for fault and to love, for love covers a multitude of sins?